Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Just want to welcome everybody back. Hope you had an awesome Memorial Day. We did and uh, had a great weekend. All my family came in. Lot's still here. I just dropped my mom off at the airport this morning, though, so she had to go back, finish up some school stuff. She's a teacher. And uh, uh, yeah, let me try to help somebody. Somebody that, that's on the call usually can't get on the, can't get on the link. Does anybody have a link uh, for this that you could put in the chat box? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paste it to the friend that's texting me. That's trying to get in. Yeah, if you can just paste the link into the chat box, I'll give it to her. Thank you. Okay. All right, all right. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, we'll just wait for a second for everybody to get on here. Um, yeah, just had a great weekend. My parents came in town, my nephew's here, my niece is here, and my dad's hanging out for a few days. And so my dad loves to organize stuff. So I'm just letting him go loose on the garage this morning. <laughs> we just, we just moved probably about a month ago and dad's passion is, uh, is garages and stuff like that. So I'm like, man, if, if it's, if it's not broke, I don't want to fix it, man. Thank you, Jesus. And so I got the best parents in the whole wide world, man. They're awesome. And we just got a great relationship and, um, yeah. All right. Good. Everybody go to John 18, John 18. And we're just going to jump in this morning. So as I told you last week, um, what we're going to do today, we're going to do, we're going to seek to do 18 and 19 and tomorrow we're going to do 20 and 21. And, uh, and there, there'll most likely be some room, especially after today I, at the, there may be a little bit of extra time today that we're going to finish up this week. So the goal is that we're going to probably finish up tomorrow. And then on Thursday, I'm going to record a, a bunch of new stuff that we're going to be releasing on Corey Russell online this summer and in the fall uh, stuff on the beauty of God. Um, uh, and just, I'm just getting recaptured up. I don't know about you, but John, you, John 14, John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, dude, it just recalibrates you. It is it is among the best, um, uh, it's one of the best sections to recalibrate you and to lift your vision higher. And if you, I, I just want to say, even as we end up, John, uh, as we end up the book of John tomorrow, I want to invite you to go back to John 13, 14. If you're on the Teach Us to Pray live session, I think I'm going to talk about John 17 tonight. I'm just in this, this whole thing about the power of Jesus's prayer to keep us and that your prayer life is only powerful to the, to the degree that you connect to the power of his prayers, to the power of his prayer. And, uh, and, and so anyway, so we're going to be recording stuff on the beauty of God. Um, I did too, Jessica. I felt born again. It lit me up and it, and it, and it reconnects me to, to know what to pray for. If we know what God's praying for, we know how to pray. And, um, and so we'll, we'll look at that tonight and then on forward. So beauty of God. I just want to look at all the different faces of Jesus. We're going to do something on the Sermon on the Mount and what I call the wineskin for revival. I call the Sermon on the Mount the wineskin for revival and building an interior life that, that you know, releases the, uh, the fire of God. And then I'll probably do, we're going to probably do something on the book of Joel. Uh, on the book of Joel. And so that's some of the stuff coming down the pike. You guys be looking for that. And so let's just jump into 18. I want to just, just cause I love John 17. Let, let's look at verse 20 of John 17. And then we're going to roll right into 18. <clears throat> and as I told you, 13 and 14 is in the upper room. 15, 16 is the walk to the garden. And John 17 is right outside of the garden of Gethsemane. Many people will say Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, but what we'll find in 18.1 is they crossed over the brook into the garden. 
So they're right outside the garden where Jesus prays, John 17. And it's 26 verses of God the Son talking to God the Father through God the Spirit. And Father, today we ask you for the spirit of revelation in the name of Jesus. Shine light on our hearts and our minds. We're weak, but we want to know you, God. We're, we're limited, but we want to know you, God. Give us what we cannot get by human wisdom or ingenuity or capacities of our own. We need the spirit of revelation to touch us in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 20. I do not pray for these alone, but for all who will believe in me through their word. You can put your name in there. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. Heck, I was praying this this morning for my marriage, that me and my wife, that me and my family would be one. You can pray this for any relationship, anything that God has called you to, that they would be one as you, Father, are in me, I in you, that they may be one in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one, I in them, you in me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and that you've loved me as you, you've loved them as you've loved me. Father, I desire that those whom you've given me may be with me where I am and that they may behold my glory for which you have given me for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Oh, righteous father, the world has not known you, but I have known you and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name and will declare it that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. 18 verse one, he prays this prayer. And that says when Jesus had spoken these words, here we go. When he had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook, brook Kajan, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now we know from Matthew 26, he told eight of them to stay here, and he took with him Peter, James, and John, and he brought them into a deeper place into the garden where he began to be deeply distressed. You'll find that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what the prayer looked like in the garden. John doesn't give us that. John gets right to more of the part of Judas. Now look at this. And it says where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered, and Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place. For Jesus often met there with his disciples. You know what struck me when I was reading that this morning? Jesus wasn't hiding from Judas. Jesus went to the place he knew Judas would find him. And, G and I just began to find Jesus was not backing down from the moment. He was actually embracing the moment. He wasn't trying to hide. There wasn't self-preservation. There was a sense of complete giving himself over to the will of the Father. And the other thing that hit me is that Jesus was betrayed in the place that he prayed. Jesus was betrayed in the place that he prayed. In the garden where he prayed was the place he was betrayed. And, and I tweeted it out this morning just because I was getting so hit with this. Jesus's prayers, and this will show you about prayer. Most of us think that if we pray, all of our problems go away. And there are many things that are removed because of prayer. But I want you to understand that prayer for Jesus didn't alleviate or remove the betrayal and the suffering, but it strengthened him to embrace it. The prayer in the garden, it didn't alleviate it, but it strengthened him for it. Many times your prayer life will strengthen you to walk through a difficult situation, a difficult circumstance, a difficult relational dynamic. Prayer strengthens you for the battle, and sometimes it doesn't alleviate the battle. It actually brings on the battle. All right? You get that? So I want you to understand that. I think a good verse with this is Hebrews 5. I just want to say this. You know, we've probably looked at this. Hebrews 5, 7 is such a good verse, and I don't want to, well, why not? You know, we're here. We can kind of hang out here at the end of this. Hebrews 5, 7, it says, right before it, it says, it quotes Psalm 2 and Psalm 110, you're my son, today I have begotten you. And then he says, you're a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, speaking of Jesus, 
when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. This sounds like the Garden of Gethsemane. He's crying out to the Father, saying, Father, he goes, if there's another way, let's do it, but not my will, but your will be done. And it, the Bible says that he was heard because of his godly fear. All right? So most of us would think that if God hears your prayers, your problems go away. What does the very next verse say? It says that he was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. We thought sonship just means we get good hug, hugs from Abba. I love good hugs from Abba. But you know what good hugs from Abba do? They strengthen you to surrender your will to him in the midst of suffering. What hugs from Abba does is it breaks down your defenses, breaks down your fear of abandonment, breaks your fear of rejection. I like to say it this way. You get sonship freely, but sonship is manifested in the midst of suffering. Okay, and prayers strengthen you in the midst of it. We, we would think that if Jesus was heard, everything would go away. How did Jesus learn obedience? Now, you ever thought about that? He's, he's God. How did he learn obedience? I, I don't think that so much it's the word that he learned something he didn't know. It's like something that's not revealed until pressure is applied. So it says this, that he manifested obedience and you wouldn't know that it was manifested until suffering was applied. All right, we're not going to go there. We're not going to go there. <laughs> All right, good, good, good. Let's just keep going. But I, I just, that's just for free, just for you guys to think about what this garden is about. Many of you have been in the garden seasons, the seasons where your will is getting processed and surrendered to the will of the Father to the will of heaven, and it's everything inside of you that's fighting tooth and nail. Everything inside of you wants to fight back, retaliate, get back, you know, scream back, and something in the place of prayer surrenders your will to God, and it puts it into his hands and saying, God, I'm going to trust you as I walk through this. Prayer strengthens you. That's why he says pray that you don't enter into temptation. The temptation to do what? Fall asleep? and not be able to navigate the coming season. Prayer keeps your eyes open to navigate the season of trial. Jesus. <clears throat> All right. And I love it. It says, Judas, who also betrayed him, knew that place. For Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief, I mean, we're talking about maybe a couple of hundred of Officers are coming with him. And Pharisees came with them, lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him. Wow, there's that word again. Remember John 13? He knew where he had come from. He knew all things were given to him. And that's what empowered him. Jesus' knowing where this was going freed him to serve. It says this, Jesus, knowing all things that would come upon him, he went forward and said to them, whom are you seeking? He didn't hide. He didn't back off. He stepped up to the plate. Get your seatbelt on. Look at this. They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Three, three words. I am he. And, when, and Judas, who betrayed him, stood with them. The Judas who was sitting at his table just hours earlier is now standing with the detachment of troops and on the enemy's side. And when they ask, who are you? They go, are you Jesus of Nazareth? He goes, I am he. And when he said this, they drew back and fell to the ground. Whoo! Whoo! Bunch of people getting slain in the spirit. Those couple of hundred officers, those Pharisees, those soldiers, Judas, a whisper, three syllables out of the mouth of the Son of God, slain all of them in the spirit. They all fell back. Whoo! Guys, I think right here he's giving us a little window 
in essence, you have no idea the power and the authority that I possess and that I carry. When I am saying I am, I am declaring what Nicola just said. I am the I am. And that phrase of who he is as the I am declared it. I am God. I am Yahweh. I am creator God and the power of my word that created the heavens and the earth. And they drew back. And yet with all that power and glory, he's going to surrender to them. He's going to surrender to the will of the Father by giving over to them. The one that can whisper things and people fall back is going to let them handcuff him. I love that. I love that John 10 where Jesus says, I have power to lay down my life. What does Jesus do with his power? He lays down his life. Okay. They, so they drew back and they fell to the ground. Then he asked them again. He goes, whom are you seeking? <laughs> so it's, gonna, it's almost like a replay. Whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. So Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way, which means this, take me, leave my disciples alone. I love Jesus for this. He's saying, leave these young guys alone. That the saying might be fulfilled, which he spoke of those whom you gave me, I've lost none. Okay. Of those that you've given me, which he just prayed in John 17, verse 12. Father, all the ones you've given me, I've not lost any of them. And Jesus is still like a shepherd preserving the flock, keeping the flock, saying, take me, leave them alone. Then Simon Peter, I love it. Simon told him earlier, he goes, I'm going to lay down my life for your sake. He says, he says I'm going to lay down my life for your sake. And Jesus says, buddy, no, you're not. Well, here's Peter's chance to lay down his life for, him sake, for his sake. And he takes a sword and he drew it and he struck the high priest servant and he cut off his right ear. <laughs> That's the best he could do with that sword. The servant's name was Malchus. Okay, now just remember this name and remember the servant of the high priest. Then Jesus, so I think Peter's looking at Jesus saying, are we going to mount up and let's do this thing? Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall, not, shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? That moment was a death blow to Peter's mindset, his whole understanding of God, and the floor fell out on him on that moment. It says, then the detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. Then they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who said earlier, I think in John uh, 12, saying, guys, it's, he goes, we don't need the whole nation to go down. He goes, it's expedient for one man to die for the nation than for the whole nation to go into ruins. He was prophesying of the death of Jesus. Now look at verse uh, 15. And it says, Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. We know the other disciple is John. Now, that disciple was known to the high priest and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. So John went in with Jesus when Jesus went before Caiaphas and was going to go before the high priest. And John was allowed into the courtyard, which must be some adjoining area and having direct access. William just asked the question, could this moment have contributed saying he didn't know Jesus? I believe it was this of saying he didn't know Jesus. When Peter said he didn't know him, he meant it. It was more than, I, I, I don't know about you, but have you ever just gotten, had something hit your faith? And for a second, you don't know him like you thought you knew him and you're discombobulated. It's the devil striking at the opportune moment when Peter's faith is shaken. When Peter's uh, faith is shaken, that's when the enemy struck. And when he said, I don't know him, he meant it. He goes, I'm, I'm having a complete overhaul in my view of God. So Peter follows. And so John opens the door for Peter to come into the courtyard. All right. So we have, uh, it was known and he went out and spoke to her who kept the door. Verse 17, then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, you aren't you are not also one of the man's disciples, are you? And he said, I'm not. Now the servants and the officers who made a fire of coal stood there, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves. This stuck out to me, this next verse. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself. 
I don't have any insight, but I think that's something that to meditate on. Peter's sitting there warming himself by the fire. The high priest then asked Jesus. So while that's going on down in the courtyard, the high priest is asking Jesus and about his, his disciples and his doctrine. And Jesus says, guys, I want you to understand, I haven't been preaching in a back room. I've been talking daily in your synagogues. I've been in your temple where all the people gather. And in secret, I've said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said, which means this. I haven't, go ask anybody that's heard any of my messages, they will tell you. And when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, wow. smacked him in the face and says, do you answer the high priest like that? Jesus answered and said, if I've spoken evil, bear witness of the evil, but if well, why do you strike me? And then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now, this is the thing that hits me. Now, Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. Therefore, they said to him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it and said, I am not. But look at verse 24. This is divine irony, divine poetry. One of the servants of the high priest, look at this, a relative of him whose ear Peter cut off, said, did I not see you in the garden with him? And Peter then denied it again, and immediately a rooster crowed. Have you ever noticed that the third girl that asked Peter on whether he was a disciple or not was a relative of Malchus, the high priest servant whom Peter cut his ear off? Which means this, the very place that Peter tried to show his devotion to Jesus, the very person that he cut his ear off, it was his cousin that released the death blow to Peter. <laughs> the divine irony of God of saying, oh my gosh, the one I tried to kill, his cousin killed me, was the final death blow. So interesting. Of all people, it was that girl. This gospel, you're exactly right. This gospel does not say that Jesus looked at Peter. We know that one of the gospels does say it. So that happens, and we know Peter goes and weeps bitterly, and it's a horrible three days for Peter. And we only know Luke 22, 31. It was because of Jesus' prayer that Peter survived those three days. Jesus' prayer upheld him and sustained him and kept him from losing his faith in those three days. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium, and it was early morning, so you have the next morning now. But they themselves did not go into the praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. It's right around the Passover season. The Jews can't go into the praetorium. That's a Gentile uh, area. So Pilate then went out to them and says, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, if he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Then Pilate says, you take him and judge him according to your law. And they go, we can't kill him. It's not lawful for us to put anyone to death. Verse 33, then Pilate entered the praetorium and called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, are you speaking for yourself about this? or are others telling you concerning me? Pilate answers, he goes, am I a Jew? Your own nation and chief priest have delivered you to me. What have you done? Now, this is an amazing verse right here, verse 36. My kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. I want you to understand that Jesus is a king and he is the king to the kingdom. He is a king over his kingdom. Right now, it's a spiritual kingdom. It's a, 
It's a real kingdom. You know the phrase by, I think, George Eldon Ladd. He says, the kingdom is already, but not yet. And this is my definition of the kingdom of God. It's wherever the rule of God is manifested. Manifested in your own life. We know the kingdom of God is peace, joy, and righteousness in the Holy Spirit. Peace, joy, and righteousness in the Holy Spirit. And so the kingdom is wherever the rule of God is manifested. Rule over the devil, sin, sickness, unity, peace, joy, righteousness. That's the kingdom. But I want to make it clear to you, there is a literal kingdom. And there's a literal kingdom. That's why he says, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that Jesus is going, that his second coming is about the bringing of the kingdom of God to the earth. Revelation 15 says, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Hallelujah. That's at the seventh trumpet. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And the glory of the millennium is the kingdom of God on the earth and all other powers are brought under the submission to his kingdom. Glory. But Jesus is saying, guys, I want you to understand right now, my kingdom's not of this world. If it were of this world, we would be, we'd be, we'd be fighting. We'd be fighting. He says, but right now, actually, all my, all my disciples are scattered. <laughs> he says, my servants would fight so that I should not be, but now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said, are you a king then? Jesus answered, you say rightly, I'm a king. For this cause, I was born. You know what? Mighty king, you know, everlasting father, righteous king. He is the king. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of glory. He is the king of the Jews. He's the king of the nations. He is the king, and he's ruling in kingdom. I have come to this world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no fault with him at all. But you have a custom. But you have a custom. Yeah, yeah, we'll get to that in a little bit. You have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They go, no, not this man, but Barabbas. And we know how, what Barabbas was. Chapter 19, verse 1. Jesus. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. That's the 40 minus one lashes. What you see in the passion of Christ is the scourging. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe and they said to him, hail king of the Jews. They struck him with their hands. They're striking the one who whispered syllables earlier last night and hundreds fell back. The one that could call on thousands of angels to come and deliver him. The one that could destroy all of them with the word of his mouth is sitting there and letting them beat him, letting them whip him, letting them scourge him and twist crowns on his head and beat him with their hands. The humility of Jesus to let them. Pilate then went out again, and they said to him, Behold, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know. I don't find any fault in him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Guys, that right there, this is how you pray the Bible. When you see a phrase like that, you see, and we have images from the passion of Christ, but you get to see a man completely beaten, bruised, bloody, purple robe on him, crown of thorns on him, and presented to everyone, behold the man. We must behold the suffering servant. We must behold him in his humility, behold him in his meekness, behold him in his humiliation. And this is what strengthens you. Peter said, we have not yet resisted to the point of bloodshed. 
which means this, whatever you're going through, behold the man in his humiliation and it will deliver you from your own rights. Beholding Jesus in his humility delivers you from your rights. Behold the man, see him, gaze on him, consider him. Isaiah 52, consider. Isaiah 53, consider the arm of the Lord. Behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, you take him and crucify him. I find no fault in him. The Jews answered, we have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. And we must hold the line. If anything you've taken from the book of John, it's the divinity of Jesus, the divinity of Jesus. And we must restore that. That's what got Jesus killed. He goes, I and my father are one. I and my father are one. Before Abraham was, I am. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He says this, when Pilate heard that saying, he was more afraid. He went again into the praetorium. You can see Pilate's confliction here. He's just back and forth, back and forth. And he says, where are you from? And Jesus gave him no answer. And I love this phrase. Look at this, guys. And this is how you need to feel about everyone right now. About when the fear of man tries to hit you. Are you not speak? Why aren't you speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you or power to release you? Jesus looked right at him and he says, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. He says, I want you to know what you have has been given to you from heaven. What you've been given has been given from heaven. And then he says this phrase. He says, therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. We see right here that there are degrees of sin. There are greater sins. And the greater sin in this situation are the Jews that handed Jesus over. And Jesus says, they're in more trouble than you. But you're still in trouble. And I want you to understand, you couldn't do nothing unless it had been given to you. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out saying, if you let this man of goat. So they're pulling on Pilate and his political uh, uh, spirit. If you say, you let this man go, you're not a Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When he heard this, he brought Jesus out, set him down in the judgment seat, and it was Passover. Make sure everybody uh, mute yourself. Mute your, mute your mic. There I go. I got you. So here it is. It says this. It says this. They cried out away with him, crucifying him. He said, behold your king. Verse 14, he says, behold your king. We got behold the man, behold your king. And Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? They go, we have no king but Caesar. But he delivered them to them to be crucified. They took Jesus away and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which in Hebrew, Golgotha, where they crucified him. And two others with him, one on either side, Jesus in the center. Now, Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And therefore, the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews. But he said, I am the King of the Jews. He goes, no, I've written what I've written. So they took his garments while Jesus was crucified, and they broke it into four parts, to each soldier a part and also a tunic. Now the tunic was without a seam, woven from the top. And they said, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it. Who it shall be that the scripture might be fulfilled, which they said, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. That's a quote from Psalm 22. And Psalm 22 is the suffering psalm. It's the suffering psalm, the messianic suffering psalm. 
Therefore, the soldiers did these things. Now look at some of these things that we're going to see between John. John's going to give us insight into some of the things that Jesus said on the cross. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus. We have his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Mary, the one who had seven demons cast out of her, is right there. And when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, we know that's John. And this is the second time that John defined himself as the one Jesus loved. He looked at Jesus and he looked at his mom and, mom and he said, woman, behold your son. Then he said to his disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. Jesus was giving his mother to John saying, take care of mom. Jesus having the ability to think about mom on the cross. After this, Jesus knowing, circle that word knowing, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. Remember, that's what he told the woman at the well. I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he says, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Therefore, because it was preparation day, the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the other who was crucified. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. Hallelujah. And the testimony is, and he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. John saying, I know what I saw, I believe what I saw, and I'm telling you what I saw so you'll believe. Now look at this. He says, for these things were done that the scripture might be fulfilled. Psalm 34, not one of his bones shall be broken. <laughs> David prophesied this, and scripture fulfilled it. His bones, not one bone was broken. And again, in another scripture, they, they look on him whom they pierce. That's Zechariah 13 or Zechariah 12. All the Old Testament references and prophecies were being fulfilled. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission so that he came and took the body of Jesus. 39, look at who shows up. And Nicodemus, John 3, Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus, bound it in the stri strips of linen with the spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one yet had been laid. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day for the tomb was nearby. We get to see the strides that Nicodemus took over that time. And now he's partnering with Joseph in wrapping Jesus's body in the burial spices and taking him to the tomb. That's so good. That's so good. A lamb with a broken leg would have been an unacceptable sacrifice. That's literally, and that, again, that's the, I think that's why John, I'm, I'm just quoting Rich was just saying something on here. And I want to tell you the whole point of the Passover was a male lamb, the firstborn without any blemish, a perfect lamb without any blemishes, without any broken legs, without anything wrong. And Jesus is the Passover lamb. That's why all this stuff is happening on Passover. He is the Passover lamb, the lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. 
And may we never graduate from the story. May we never move on, but may we consider, may we behold the man, may we behold the lamb, may we behold our king, the king who laid down his life, the king who suffered, king who suffered all the way. He loved us all the way to the end. And I don't know why it's hitting me new today that it ever has. Beginning in John 18, Jesus wasn't hiding. <laughs> I just want to pray for us, and then I want to, then I'll open it up for questions, thoughts, or anything. And as we're we're winding up the book of John. I want to give some room these last couple of days for other thoughts or things. But Lord, I ask you right now for us, open up our eyes to behold the man. Open up our eyes to behold the king. Behold the lamb, I pray. Father, we ask you right now for that water and blood that flowed from his side to wash over us now, to break off all shame, to break off all guilt, to break off all condemnation, that you would cleanse us of all of our sins, that you would wash us and make us new in your water and your blood. God, I ask you to cleanse us and make us new, and I just thank you, Jesus. And I pray for revelation of the Lamb of God, revelation of you in your suffering glory. And I ask you to strengthen me as I walk through life in different circumstances, deliver me from the worship of my rights. You gave up all your rights, Jesus. And I ask you to transform us by it in the name of Jesus. Yes. Amen. Whenever I think upon the mature remaining humble enough to continue to receive, I am reminded being wiped out, but by one of his words of being loving enough to share that with all of us. Yes, I love that, Pam. I, I, one of my, and again, it brings us back to John 10. No one takes it from me. John 10, he goes, I want all you jokers to know none of y'all are taking my life. I have power. And with my life, I lay down my life. And with power, I will raise up my life. That's the power. That's exactly right, Ann. Isaac didn't run or hide either. I imagine Isaac could have scurried off from Abraham, but he surrendered to Abraham. All right, some thoughts, questions about today or anything recently that you would want to talk about in John. Jesus. I have a question, Corey, about John 13. Yes. Okay. Um, is it kind of a crossover? To go, everybody turn to John 13 so we can see it together. Well, it's a crossover question from Teach Us to Pray. You said we should meditate on come, Lord, or the Spirit and the Bride say come. And in John 13, when Jesus was washing our feet, you said when we pray, come, Lord, we're saying come serve me. Can you talk about that? Every time you say, come Holy Spirit, you're asking him to come serve you. That's going to happen in intimacy. Like this morning, you woke up, and whenever time you say the word come, you're saying, come and be who you are. And every time he comes, he serves. He, he blesses. He strengthens. He washes. He renews. We just asked him right now to wash us in his blood. That's service. That's serving. We're asking him to do something that we can't do for ourselves, and he humbles himself to do it. And ultimately, the greatest service ever is Jesus' second coming when he comes and delivers us from a wicked man, a wicked government on the earth, and he descends and he serves us by destroying all of our enemies, raising our dead bodies, or raising us who are alive to meet him in the air, and he's serving us. Thanks, and Corey. so all that he does is serving everything. <laughs> Amen.
Anybody else? Hey, Corey. Hey, Carlos. Hey, uh, I just want to share how uh, I'm so impressed. And I was woken up by the Holy Spirit this morning around five o'clock in the morning. And just going over the scripture where Jesus is under so much agony, so much pain on, on that cross, brothers. And the, fir the first thing that he has in his mind is pure love saying, hey, take care of my mom. Look at her. Yes. Because now she's your mom. So Jesus was showing us that in this life here on earth, we're going to endure pain and we're going to go through suffering. But we got to remember that sacrifice and that love that overcomes everything, Corey. I love it, Carlos. Amen. And the power of Jesus. Oh, God, impart that spirit to us in the name of oh, Jesus. Oh, amen. Amen. All right. Somebody else, any question about anything in John or, or something about Jesus, or you just want to scream? <laughs> Corey, can you um, talk a little bit more about, um, I, I think it's in John 6, and then um, a little bit later, like I think we talked about last week about how God or the Father gives us to Jesus um, and kind of that dynamic, like, okay, well, the, he, Jesus is a door, but God gives us to Jesus. And does he not give some people to Jesus? Like, how does, what's, my brain's a little. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, I'll look at what you're talking about in John 17, where he said this. He says, I have met, verse six, I have manifested your name to the men whom you've given me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me. Okay. I think he's talking specifically about those disciples. You gave me these men that would be my intimate ones that would run with me and that would be with me forever. And guys, I'm just wrecked. Those apostles, their names are on the foundations of the new Jerusalem. Peter, who denied Jesus, has his name on the foundation of the new Jerusalem. When, when I'm seeing the fact that the ones that were given to Jesus you know, I, I don't want to delve in. I don't like, I don't like the conversation. I don't, it's past my pay grade about trying to choose about what if, are there elect, are there this, are there that? My belief is that he came for the whole world and my desire and mission is for the whole world. And desire and mission is that all would be given to Jesus. I believe that's the heart of God and the heart of Jesus but I think he's specifically referencing the specific ones that the father gave to Jesus to run with him for those three and a half years. And he's saying, thank you, father, for these specific ones. And we know that he spent all night in prayer before he called his disciples. And so I believe that there were specific callings on these apostles because of the weight that would be on their life. And, the, and Jesus is telling the father, father, thank you for the gifts. Thank you for the gifts of these young men that would be with me. So I, I'm thinking specifically about them and not generally in a, an election or non-elected people. William, go. Yes, I am looking at um, Nicodemus who came to Jesus by night um, versus the Jews who had like all these different conversations with Jesus. And um, we saw Nicodemus made some strides, as you mentioned. And I am thinking that our heart posture is very important when we come to Jesus. Otherwise, we would not be able to receive anything. Because the Jews had so many conversations with him and there was no change in their manner. Or, or there was no conviction or anything like that. Yeah. You're exactly right. Yeah, there's something that transpired in Nicodemus's heart. And I think, I think that's why Jesus gave him, I think John 3 is so important because he shared this with Nicodemus and Jesus alone knew how he would respond to him, but it is how we come to him. I think Nicodemus came with an agenda and it's like the Lord shifted the tables on him and brought him in. And we see that. Um, Corey, I've got a question. 
Um, yes. The Praetorium, did you say that that was a Gentile area? Yes. Yes. Um, that's, why, that's why Jews wouldn't, during Passover, they wouldn't go in there because it was a defiled area. So, I mean, uh, when you said that, I, I actually thought that was such a beautiful, if I can say, symbolism for how the, the questioning between, like, of the inner turmoil that Pilate was going through, you know, that he did that in a Gentile area. I think wow. Um, wow. one of the things that I've really loved about John 17 was in verse 20, where um, he says, you know, I don't just pray for these, but I pray for those who will believe through their word. Yes. Um, and we kind of take all of that with the Spirit speaking through us and all that. And, and I, 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 yeah. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Jesus. Come on, keep them coming, people. Hey, Corey. Yes. Um, yeah, last Thursday when we were talking about John 17 and we were talking about um, the Father being in, and the, uh, the Son being in the Father and us being in them and all that, I was thinking about in Genesis and how that we're created in the image of God and and how that that was Jesus's cry was for us to realize that, wow. to understand, um, you know, that it wasn't just from us acknowledging our salvation as him as our savior, but we were created in his image for that very purpose. And I don't know, it just like really hit me. And it's like, that would solve all the identity problems on the earth if we could only realize that before the foundation of the world, we were handcrafted in the image of God. And then God was all throughout the Old Testament speaking to all the different people through Jesus, through Holy Spirit, though we don't recognize it that way lots of times. But then God knew that Jesus had to come to the earth so that he could truly uh, exemplify the image of who God created us to be so that we could see it with our natural right. eyes. Yes. You know? It's just like... Yeah, so much. We, we were created for compatibility with God. Yeah. And there are two deep longings. I like to think with, I think when I think about it, he made us in, in his image and according to his likeness. Yeah. And I think it speaks about two realities. The fact that he created us with the ability to relate spirit to spirit with God, the direct ability for communion and intimacy with no shame. No shame, intimacy with no shame. And then the second one is standing in the image of God, actually being his representatives in the earth, actually having dominion in our very psyche that God set us over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air. And that intimacy and dominion are the deepest part of our new creation identity. But it's dominion through, through servanthood and through humility and through sacrifice that we see it. Jesus came as God's man to elevate man. That's why he's called the last Adam to, you know, that's why Paul's whole reality of the first Adam did this. The last Adam did this to restore things. It's all about the garden in Genesis one. You were made by him and you were made for him. I love it. Compatibility. Shatai. Come on, somebody, anything. Hey, Corey. Uh, my name's Peter. Um, I just want to tell you thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, because my wife and I, we were at a point where we wanted more. We wanted more, and, and um, just thank you, brother. I mean... Thank you so much. Please, uh, please tell your wife and your girls that we said thank you. And um, I mean, th you know what God did through us. I mean, He used you in our lives big time. So I just want to say thank you so much, brother. Thank you for telling me that. That massively encourages me. Thank, thank you, brother. Justin, go. 
So, um, so I also agree with what he just said. Uh, but John uh, chapter 19, verse 19, that, I don't know, for some reason this is sticking out to me right now, that Pilate was chosen to write and identify who Jesus was as the king of the Jews. And it was like a prophetic declaration to the Jewish nation yes. that this is your Messiah. And I don't know, I just think about us now as, as people that have been grafted in, we come into his sheepfold and how it's now a prophetic declaration still to the Jewish nation, to, to, the, to the people who are lost to come back into the sheepfold because this is your Messiah who hung on a cross for you, who paid your penalty in full. <laughs> Um, back and, and, and be, you know, what, what God intended, what God saw the whole time, you know, I, I, I don't know, that's just sticking out to me right now, how, how beautiful that is. That, that, he that moment changed everything. That was the prophetic statement. Jesus is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel and he's the king forever. And that is, man, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Somebody else, go. This is so beautiful. It's just washing. Hi, Corey. It's Jessica. Hey, Jessica. Um, I was thinking, well, John 17, now I understand why when people, like, give their life to the Lord, they give them, like, the book of John, like, in a little booklet. <laughs> Me too. Um, so I was thinking the correlation between, because I, I do have family members that recently came to the Lord, but do not understand um, like presence and the sacrifice. Um, so I've been asking the Lord, like, how do I communicate that? Because oftentimes it's through the Holy Spirit. So I saw the correlation between John 3, 16, John 17, 13 through 19, which was so good. Um, I am, I think it says, I say these things that while I'm still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. Um, and, and anyway, it's through 19, but, and then John 19, seven, which I didn't know that it was like the law, like you cannot claim that you are the, the child of God and how Jesus just sacrificed his life to break that is like he broke the mold of how the world was thinking which separates us forever yeah, um sure. and, and even in the world now the the lack of knowing this um separates people from the lord from yeah. god yes so it's just been like wow so i'm just thinking like when people get saved like hey go go to john like and let's talk after you read john i think it's the best book I think it's the best book. It's so filled so much. And tomorrow, I mean, like I, we're kind of eking out today because we've walked through the story many times, but tomorrow we're going to get a lot of insight into Jesus's interaction with the disciples post-resurrection. And then we're going to get to see Peter's restoration. I want you guys, when we go, we're going to see the breakfast where Jesus asked the big question, do you love me? You, and, and so we're going to redo all that. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to talk about how he blew on his disciples. <laughs> Jesus released Holy Spirit on his disciples by blowing on them. Anyway, I got to go today, guys. But um, I love you. Read John. Just read it again. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Just keep yourself in this flow. And for you guys who are on the Teachers to Pray, we'll be on tonight. If you haven't jumped on, there's still room. There's still time. Jump on. Get on with us. It's all on Corey Russell online. I love you guys. You bless me and you strengthen me. And I'll see you soon. Bye.